five beginner war tips. This is pretty much the starting beginner course in war. Obviously, this is not for everybody. Obviously, there's no one way to play anything correctly. Hopefully, these tips will help you either just starting war, if you've been in war for a little bit but having a hard time get there, or if you've been in war for a long time and have been doing it wrong. These are tips that pretty much will always be the right first stop when determining how to become better at war. Without any further ado, we're going to start with tip number one, and that is war is won by attacks. War is won by attacks. It's that simple. Now, many of you are going to be like, duh, Tony, but I really need you to hear it again. War is won by attacks, specifically eight victories per person. Granted, someone can get 12 victories, someone can get 6 victories. It is a team effort, that is the most important thing, knowing where you're around, uh, what the people in your alliance are willing to do, and most importantly, what you're likely to see when you go into a war. All those things factor in. Irrelevant, war is won by winning fights. Wars are not won by defense. A war could be won in part by how amazing your defense went. Uh, the earlier you are in the game, the lower your TCP, and we're talking about millions here, not, you know, 10,000, 15,000. The lower millions your TCP is, the more likelihood you have to be facing off against people that are very similar to you. As a result of that, one mistake that I see a lot in uh, lower TCP alliances, and to be fair, some higher ones, is they go really, really hard on making sure they have specific war defense teams that are really, really super duper strong and and the, the, every single slot is filled. And yes, that is important, but it's not more important than making sure that you, as a player, are good for every single attack you can do. If you can do three or four attacks in a war, but your defense is getting 10 wins, great. How long is that gonna be relevant? Probably not much. And more importantly, how frequently is that happening? Probably not many. You are only as good to your alliance as your offensive capabilities. Your defenses, as traditionally go, are bonuses to that. So maybe you can't win every single fight you go into. Maybe you're up against matchups where you just don't have the answers and your defense makes up for that. You know what would have been better? If every time you went into a fight, you killed the opponent's team. War is won by attacking. Therefore, when you start war at the beginning and as you progress, you always want to make sure that your attack teams are not only the strongest, but you have most of them. Do you have an Asgardians team? Great. They're an offense team. They're an offense team until they can be replaced by a different or better offense team. Then you can feel free to move them to defense. Well, Tony, what do I do on defense in these situations? Who cares? Stopping people from beating nodes is relevant at the very early stages of war and middle stages of war when it comes to specific nodes. You don't want them to take your bridge or your reactor early in the war because those are worth the most points, so those rooms should be defended by the people with the strongest TCP that have the most they can put there. Every other room, it doesn't necessarily matter what's in the room to defend against because you're fighting for points. And if you have eight teams and they have three teams, two or three really good defense teams, and everything else is useless, you're going to get more points than them. Move to the middle before you start full clearing, but when everything's throwing haymakers, you have to defend more rooms, but those two and 300 you know, value rooms as you add them up don't equal the same. You need to be able to beat the Marauders before you worry about defending against teams that can beat the Marauders. Yes, over time, the Marauders will end up being a great defense team, as will many teams. It's true, but right now, the Marauders need to be used to counter the Marauders if you and your alliance don't have enough answers. Winning a fight will win you more wars. Everybody in your alliance being aggressively capable of winning fights will give you more value in war overall and will help you get higher and higher, especially against the people who think defense is king. For this case, that's pretty much everything just to show you i have quite a bit of characters on offense in my war so it's not something that's only exclusively low level it's something that happens the higher up you get in war to make sure that you're uh, capable of defeating your opponents especially when you move to the full clear territory because at that point it's a race and it's a timed race moving to the second tip 
this one's going to be a little bit easier, I think, to grasp, is going to be the concept of anchoring. Anchoring is a process by which you decide where the most important rooms are. Some people will say the last two rooms are the most important because players will uh, have to clear those nodes in order to either you know clear the uh, lane or take the entire room. That's not incorrect. That's actually pretty accurate. Uh, on the other side, some people say it's the first two rooms because it uh, makes people kind of force themselves into using good teams early. The answer is, it's all of them. It's the first two rooms and the last two rooms. And when you're playing the game, wherever you are, whatever your TCP is, the first two rooms and the last two rooms, starting with one, eight, two, seven, is the order by which you, as a player, want to place your strong, or just in general, your defense teams. Anything else, you could put whatever you like. If you notice here, you can, by all means, drop out uh, a hand team, a Cree team, maybe whatever, in the middle, because it doesn't matter, because those are fill slots. People still have to beat them, whether they use a real team to do it, or whether they waste the time and use an energy uh, just to do it. It's, it's nodes that gotta be beaten. The earlier you are in the game, less people have smaller rosters, they don't have the power or resources to bring up many teams, it costs them just as much to beat a node full of one decent character and a handful of shield troopers as it does to con you know, beat a, a slightly invested in team where you have more teams on offense. So as you're starting to place defenses, you want to have your first slot and your eighth slot as the strongest ones. First slot so that people might not go into your fight. Uh, and if they do decide to go from two all the way up, the eighth slot will stop them. So they will have two really strong or really hard to beat teams, whatever that happens to be for you. Maybe it's Asgardians, Black Order, whatever you want to call it, Marauders. Those are the teams you worry about. Then you start filling in accordingly. And I do say strongest as in the most powerful as well as the best in war. Um, any teams you see here are relatively consistent defense teams with the exception of garbage guys I have over here. That's just a team I use to fill this in. You can, by any means, however you want, place characters wherever you want them to go. No big deal, but as a team's value goes up, you want to make sure that the bookends or the anchors of your war room are covered before you move on. Going into the next point, point three, it's actually not much different than what I just said, but this is the first time we're starting to talk about an entire alliance. Book three is called... Uh, is called the force now the force is also a simple idea but i need to explain to a lot of people why every person in your alliance should have the exact same meta team whatever that meta team happens to be in slots one and two every single person if you don't have them, you're not quite ready for this strategy yet, so it's not that big of a deal, but try to come as close as possible. From the previous rule, we were discussing how the book ends, you know, the first two and the last two are the most important. But the first two, all being the same team, gives you a strategic advantage in war for one really simple reason. You are now taxing your opponent's answers to your questions. Do you have an answer for the hydra team do you have an answer for the mercenaries the asgardians uh fury shield whatever the defenders in some of the earlier stages when people made mistakes and works on them you know you're telling your opponents not only do you have to have an answer for this team and this team one of those two because they're not going to go further if they can't beat you know both of them you're saying you need to have the answer to that every node that you try to get past starting at the beginning of flight deck they see wait a minute flight deck one we'll use for the sake of the argument these two teams as guardians and fury shield first two nodes and then the second row fury shield as guardians first two nodes and then they go to the the middle flight deck two same thing once you create that your opponents have less information they don't know who the easier fight is going to be all they know is that so-and-so 
and such and such have the same teams at slightly different powers, and some of you might have a 400k as Guardians team, where others might have a 300k as Guardians team. They have no idea what the end is going to be. They don't have to all be the same defense teams, but you might have a 600k Black Order waiting at the end because you went super hard on them. You might have a very small Mercenaries team. It doesn't matter. If the first two nodes are the same team across the board on every node that you can possibly fit them in, you are taxing your opponent's answers to those teams, which can also mean that if nobody's online on their side that has a way to beat the Asgardians, they're not going to get past that lane until someone is. Or they're going to spend a lot of resources, and you're going to end up with defense wins that you weren't planning on, and you're going to be in a pretty good spot because they're wasting their resources. That is getting a little bit more detailed, uh, trying to make sure that the value of that is seen. It's hard to get an entire alliance on the same page, but I promise you, no matter where you are, no matter what power level you are, if you start taking away intelligent decision-making from the people you're, you're up against, whether they're using it or not, you're going to end up with more free wins than you've ever expected. Number four, uh, controversial, learn to take wars off. Um, I know that that becomes less relevant the higher up you go, but I've had the most success I've ever had uh, playing in an alliance where we understood the importance of avoiding burnout, so we had off wars. Now, off wars don't mean that everybody doesn't log in and everyone goes to sleep. It doesn't. It just means that you're not spending money, you're not spending a ton of resources, you're technically banking resources so that at another time, usually the next war, whenever that one will come, uh, you can hit it really hard and really fast. To succeed in war, you truly only need to go four and two. To stay pretty average in war, you only need to go three and three. These are the numbers that are factual and realistic. These are the uh, truths of war. You don't need to win every war. As a matter of fact, I'd argue you can't win every war. And I don't think that's a bad thing. I think that there's three wars a week. I think that there's a lot of time across war. I think war is a very big time sink in the game. And I think it's unrealistic for most people to think that being competitive means going hardcore to the door every war. That rhymed. I think that taking a war off, whether it be on Monday, because Monday wars tend to be wars that you personally face off against people that try really, really, really hard. Or maybe it'll be the Wednesday war, and I'm just guessing random days, because on the Wednesday war, half of your alliance, who happens to be in another time zone, uh, just can't possibly get enough resources in time to make relevant attacks. Or you understand what I'm saying at this point. Learn to take wars off. I used to schedule every Monday off when I was uh, in a, a pretty decent competitive alliance. And as a result of that, sometimes we won wars we weren't expecting because we take Mondays off. We knew we were taking it off. And then the people we were paired against weren't that strong and we could just casually beat them. It doesn't change the fact that on Wednesday everyone was expected to be really serious about war. You know, get your extra tax in early, whatever you want to call it, be on at the right times. But it gave us the opportunity to get uh, pleasantly surprised by victory as opposed to actively disappointed by defeat. One of the best things about this strategy is the first one you get to pick, but the second loss you could just audible. So if you say, I'm not going to war on, or I'm going to win my Monday war, my Wednesday war, or whatever day it works for you, is going to be uh, a skip. And then my Thursday war or my Saturday war or whatever day, we're going to go hard. Well, say you skip your Wednesday war and you lose. And then you skip your Friday war or you go hard in your Friday war and you happen to lose that one too because not every war is winnable. Well, the good news is all that did was say if I continue with my strategy of winning two more wars instead of, uh, you know, going hardcore every one and kind of spreading your resources out. You could still go 3-3, three and three, which makes the war season fundamentally a wash. You didn't lose anything. You didn't necessarily gain anything. You just kept going. 
Uh, or you can still win those three wars in a row, go four and two, and progress a little bit as far as trophies are concerned. So that's it as far as that. Moving into number five, and the last thing is more of a, a philosophical approach. It's about avoiding toxicity. Toxicity is weird in this game because it can mean a lot of things. For example, if your alliance is full of a handful of casual slash um, pseudo relaxed players and one of your players is constantly calling out war attacks and tagging people in discord and uh, reminding people of who they should work on, well, that's toxic behavior. That doesn't necessarily mean that that person is toxic, but the behavior in your environment is toxic. People are casual, whether it be a casual spender or a casual player. Hearing that makes people less interested or kind of bothered by playing, which the honest answer is that player probably would be more at home in a more competitive or serious alliance. More often than not, that player can't afford to be in a more competitive or serious alliance yet, but you know how it goes. On the other side, if you are a competitive and serious alliance and you're playing uh, as seriously as you can in war and there's a player who isn't really buying extra war attacks and isn't logging in, while that person himself might not be toxic because it's affecting 20 so odd other people, uh, their behavior is being toxic and they should probably either look to be a more casual uh, alliance or maybe you should look to replace them with somebody who is willing to keep up at your level and as a result pretty much nobody's going to ever do this on their own a casual player in a competitive alliance is not going to want to leave because they're getting some resources for free or taking advantage of others and a hardcore player is probably not going to leave a very casual alliance because they are not quite at the point where they can compete where, at the level that they want to and face off against uh, opponents that they can still beat. So it's important to identify that level and find a good home for people if you do care about war. But just overall, to always consider the people that are in the alliance with you as uh, your friends or at the very least your co-workers and treat them as if their responsibility is the same as yours and that you want to get to the same place, which is a war victory. Doesn't necessarily matter if your style is too different, just play to the style that the rest of your people are and you can avoid being toxic, which is going to ultimately lead to more wars. A kind of post note, you know, the five things are done. This is just an extra piece of information. Not every war is winnable. And I really want everyone to understand that. You're not gonna win every war you go into. You're not going to lose every war you go into. Not every war is going to be an 11 to 40 million punch up. You know, not every war is going to be a garbage fight, but not every war has to be winnable. You know, go into war and treat every war as what it is. 24 people fighting 24 other people. If you win, great. If you lose, that's okay too. You'll get them next time. Goldfish memory is relevant in war. Don't worry if you lost. It doesn't mean you have to kick people. It doesn't mean you have to change your entire strategy. Sometimes you'll just lose. It's over time and multiple losses or multiple wins that you can determine a strategy is or isn't working and if something needs to be changed. Anyway, hopefully that was helpful. I will have some more in-depth and detailed war uh, contents moving on to an intermediate video in the future. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this. If there's anything in particular you want to know about war, comment below and let me know, and I'll do whatever I can to answer that question as accurately as I can. I wish I could tell you certain things like, these are the best war teams. That information doesn't exist. If you want popcorn content like that, there's plenty of other content creators that'll lie to you. Have a good night. Have a great day. I'm Tony Spangili, and I'll catch you later. <laughs>